Hello everybody and welcome. We are starting a new series on the channel today in which we are coming over to Greenfield Village and Henry Ford Museum, well known to any of you who are local to the Detroit area, and we are going through those planes, trains, and automobiles, that wonderful collection they have in both of those facilities. We're going to go from you know, freight to racing and everything in between, so stick with us and I'm sure you'll really enjoy this new series that we're starting. We are here with probably the big showstopper uh, of the museum. One of the pieces that almost anybody recognizes when they come here, the Allegheny locomotive. It's a beast, a behemoth of a train, as you can see. Uh, and it is, as far as I know, the largest steam locomotive ever built. Uh, its purpose was to haul coal from West Virginia up those steep mountain passes, uh, hauling those massive, massive freight loads across the country you know, to power the industry of the mid-20th century. So that's what this was made for. As I said earlier, last in existence, and it was acquired by the museum before it was cut to scrap. So it's a real lucky piece that we got here. We gotta go around and check out some of these mechanics, because you, you, you can imagine this is gonna be something to behold. Let's go take a look. So here we are, we are next to, well, I don't even know how to describe this, some of the, the mechanisms that drive this massive train. I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about the mechanics that power this thing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this thing, this train, this behemoth, <laughs> was meant for hauling coal up a incline from the eastern, uh, eastern half of West Virginia and the western half of uh, East Virginia, if that's not confusing enough, uh, all the way across the Allegheny Mountains, hence the name, to deliver coal to the industrial heartlands of America. It was, of course, primarily in service around the World War II era and existed just on the cusp before the diesel locomotive took over the game. Now, little known fact about this massive train, no diesel locomotive has ever really surpassed the horsepower that this thing can put out. The reason the diesel locomotive was picked over these massive steam engines is that they were much more economical. This steam engine could put out something like 7,500 horsepower, although it was practically measured around 7,000 horsepower in daily use. So, this is a powerful train, as you can tell. Uh, it's powered by a reciprocating piston, uh, which you know spits out a lot of energy, and it requires a an absolutely insane amount of fuel to run. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But these trains were really used for everything in their era. I mean, there was no better train to cross the mountains with. Uh, and it, if you tried it with anything else, you wouldn't succeed. You know, these these hills were not an insurmountable uh, obstacle to, to to face. So these massive these massive wheels, these massive pistons that you can see behind me are all necessary to generate the force to get yourself with all that coal up the mountains. And as a side note, it wasn't just coal that these things hauled as well. I mean, it was everything from passengers to even prisoners of war during the Second World War. So these trains have seen a lot of service in a lot of different areas. But uh, needless to say, it's certainly a marvel of engineering. <laughs> joining me in the cab of the Allegheny locomotive here, and I want to talk for a second about what it took to drive this beast of a train. Now, if you look around the instrument cluster, if you look around all the stuff up front, uh, you'll notice something that stands out pretty quick. It's that firebox on the lower central part of the train. Uh, that, of course, is the beating heart of this engine, where the fuel goes in and the magic happens, so to speak. So, you can imagine this being a steam train, that it took quite a bit of coal to power this thing. Now, something that a lot of people don't know is that no human being could shovel enough coal fast enough to power this train as it went through the mountains uh, at any reasonable speed or, or, or power. So they had to install a system, a feeder system, to, to load the coal right in from the, uh, the compartment behind me, from the carrying compartment behind me, all the way into the firebox. Now, the man sitting in my position here, his job 
was to manage that flow. So gone are the days of yore when you're shoveling coal into the firebox. He's sitting here with a lever or with an implement just managing the amount of coal that's, that's being fed into the firebox. Now speaking of coal, let's talk a little bit about how much it took to power this thing. Uh, this train had a speed of about 45 miles per hour. A lot of you are like, oh that's slow. Remember the size, and remember what it's transporting and where, up mountains with thousands upon thousands of pounds of coal behind it. So, for that, uh, for that speed to be achieved, the power that this thing would have to put out is immense, and it's certainly expressed at both size and look. Uh, this is actually, as I mentioned previously, more powerful than any diesel locomotive made at the time, and, and for a while since, the only reason they transferred away from it is that it cost so much to run it with all the coal that they had to uh, switch over to diesel instead. Now, let's talk about the driving of this for a second. As you can see, I'm sitting in one of the chairs here. There were two men who operated this. Believe it or not, this entire system was operated by two men. We had a driver and what was called a fireman. The fireman operated the firebox, right? He fed the coal into the firebox and operated the system there. Now, traditionally, the fireman would be the one shoveling the coal into the train. Not the case here. Like I mentioned earlier, he was operating a lever system that had a track that would feed the coal directly into the firebox. So his job got a little bit less labor intensive. He got to sit down a lot more often. Then the driver, uh, who sat just opposite to me there, would, if you'll follow me over here, would operate this lever system here. This is the acceleration, the brakes, the gears of all sorts, and also had a prime view out the window to make sure, at least to the best of ability, that they weren't smacking anything. Which, in this, if you get hit by it, yeah, you're not coming back. <laughs> if anything gets hit by this, it's gonna get eviscerated. This is bigger than most other things, let alone vehicles or people. But anyway, the, the driver would operate the steam mechanisms. You can see the various levers here. Uh, the whistle, of course. Uh, the pressure would be operated at this location as well. There's a lot of different valves to manage, and that was the driver's primary responsibility. The fireman also acted as sort of a co-pilot in addition to operating the lever system because his job didn't involve shoveling anymore. So let's go outside and let's talk about what it took to get this train into this building. I think you can imagine it's not a very easy task. So let's go take a look. So I want to talk a little bit about what it took to get that Allegheny from well, its original location into this museum. As you can imagine, it was a Herculean task, uh, to say the least. That train, of course, being one of the biggest that was ever produced, is not easily fit into most buildings, as you can imagine. So these doors behind me, which were installed when the museum was built to allow other trains access into the museum, had to be completely taken off of the building. As well, they had to cut an additional hole in the structure to make sure that the Allegheny could fit. They made it to the exact size of the Allegheny so it could just slip right on through. I mean, can you imagine that, trying to get that sort of train into this sort of building? I mean, they had to widen the doors, they had to, they had to make a whole ton of adjustments. I mean, you can see the final product of it now. They had to make a whole ton of adjustments just to make sure the Allegheny could get in and out if necessary. Not that there's any interest in removing that train at this point, because I don't know that anybody could, <laughs> has the willpower to move such a beast. So moving on from the Allegheny, although it is certainly uh, an amazing piece and something very interesting to talk about, um, we're going to talk about a couple of the other trains that we have in the collection here today. So the second most popular, next to the Allegheny of course, uh, is probably this train behind me here. It is an 1858 Rogers steam locomotive. Uh, something interesting about this train is that it is wood fired and not coal fired, so uh, it's a completely different fuel mechanism than the Alleghenies or any of the other trains that we really have here. It's maybe one of the older ones that we have here and it has quite an interesting fact about it. So it ran 
a pretty standard career for most of its life. But in 1929, when these facilities opened, of course, Greenfield Village and Henry Ford Museum, it transported President Herbert Hoover from, the, from his location to the museum. It was the last time the president had been transported on any steam locomotive, uh, and it has that distinction. Now, you can see on the plate behind me, it's called the president, right? It has the date October 21st, 1929, and that is when it transported Herbert Hoover to this location. So we brought it here, we stored it here, and uh, now it has the distinction of being appreciated by thousands upon thousands of guests every year. A couple other features to note about this train is that, much like some of the other trains we have in our collection, it has a plow in front. Now, for those of you who don't know, that is to push debris of any sort out of the way, especially uh, larger pieces that might be a hindrance to the train. Uh, there is a bit of a trope about cattle. Certainly that's possible, but it's mostly meant for larger debris. Moving down the line a little bit from the presidential train, uh, let's talk a little bit about this Baldwin locomotive that we have behind me. It's a 1909 Baldwin, uh, and its original purpose was to haul iron ore to and from its destination. Now, it's much smaller than the Allegheny we saw earlier, but in a way, it is the Allegheny of its time. It's the iron ore Allegheny in many ways, much before the 40s. So, now this is very important in its own right, and it definitely shares, uh, it definitely earns its place in locomotive history. So the next train on our list doesn't really even look like a train at first glance. It looks like a massive snowplow, which is exactly what it is. This is the 1923 Canadian Pacific snowplow. A little known aspect of railway life that seems obvious when you think about it is that you gotta plow the snow off of it in the northern regions, and that's what this was made for. It was built in Montreal for that express purpose and served for many, many years in the northern United States and Canada, clearing the snow off the railway tracks. It has a lot of different features. It can be raised and lowered to avoid damage on the tracks and basically it would run through, clear the way, and allow the other trains to move through after those heavy snowfall days. And we're lucky enough to have it here in the museum. All right, so a couple of honorable mentions uh, before we move on here. Um, we have two replica trains in our collection as well. Behind me is the Rocket, and in front of me is the DeWitt. Now, the Rocket uh, is a replica of a train built for the Manchester and Liverpool Railway in Britain. Uh, there was a contest on uh, a best design, and this won out. The original Rocket, of course, is in England, and this was a reproduction uh, given to Henry Ford in 1929. Now, in front of me is the DeWitt. Now, the DeWitt was, the, was a replica of the third train ever built for service on an American railroad. Uh, I believe in the 1830s, I think 1831. So, a little aesthetic fact about this train is that it hauls horse carriages and not traditional rail cars. Uh, something that's unusual to the eye at first, but you have to remember this is the only, the third train ever made for use on an American railroad. So, they didn't have rail cars yet, they just used horse carriages. And this uh, operated, at least the, the model this was made off of, operated in New York. Now, this particular object here was made for display in the 1891 Chicago World's Fair. So it does have a little bit of history there as well. But this, of course, is a replica. It's not the original. The railroad door had to be removed to allow number 1601 to squeeze through. Today, 1601 is the most photographed object in Henry Ford Museum. Could be about continuing fascination with superpower. Thank you all so much for joining us today on this, our inaugural episode uh, of our new series. I'm really excited to go through and show you guys all of these mechanical marvels uh, in the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village. Like I said earlier, we got planes, we got trains, and we got cars, so it's something to get excited about. We got history of racing, uh, and we might even bring Jimmy back to do uh, an episode or two with us. So for those of you who got introduced to our channel through Jimmy Attard, uh, there'll be more of him as well. But otherwise, thank you again so much for joining. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Otherwise, signing off.